I grew up outside of Philadelphia. I went to Catholic school growing up. I went to ballet class. When it came to my school life, it's where I excelled. It's what I enjoyed. I loved to read books. I felt safe at school. I felt safe around people who pledged their life to educate me and to take care of me and to treat me as someone worthwhile. But what was really happening at home was that school was the only safe place I had. I used to sleep in the library at school because it wasn't safe to sleep at home or I wasn't able to sleep because there was men in my bedroom at night. I had um, men that my mom knew that would come to my ballet classes and my ballet recitals. The men who would pick me up from school or at the bus stop, we would just call them uncles. They weren't my uncles. They were men that wanted to spend time with me. I had parents that unfortunately didn't love each other, didn't love their children, and loved money more. My mom, I know that she was abused by her dad. If a survivor does not get help with their trauma that they've endured, sometimes they do perpetuate that onto another person. And so from six to 18, my mom sold me to men in our community. Human trafficking is the second largest criminal activity in the world. It recently surpassed arms tra trafficking. It is second only to drug trafficking. Because guess what? The traffickers, the gangs, the organized crime, they have figured out where you can sell a drug or a weapon only one time. You can sell a man or a woman or a boy or a girl over and over and over again. The buyers were stockbrokers, lawyers, doctors, dentists, things with a respectable um, title, but then also a respectable income. There are men that prayed before they uh, spent time with me, and then there are men that would turn on their favorite movie and tell me all about why it was their favorite movie. For some survivors of trafficking, um, certain acts have certain payment. For my family, it was the amount of time invested. And then if they wanted the act filmed, that would raise the price point as well. My mom, she was connected to a family friend who was like an uncle. He had a business mindset of, well, if we use Liz in child pornography, then we could make even more money and we could distribute the films however we choose. It is absolutely plausible that you can be trafficked out of your own bedroom and go to school every day and no one knows. Human trafficking is the exploitation of human beings for either the purposes of commercial sex or forced labor, and the trafficker uses force, fraud, or coercion to actually make money off of that person's back. Human trafficking is modern day slavery, and these victims find themselves in situations that they literally cannot get out of. Force is anything that you can imagine when that word comes into your head, right? It's the beatings the burnings, the rape, the gang rape. The ways that they could control me could look like, if you don't do this, I'm going to hurt you worse than, the, than I did last time. For my uncle, I knew that his violence could be unimaginable. Victims have been shot, they've been knifed, they've been mutilated and tortured in absolutely horrendous ways. The fraud, of course, uh, we deal with a lot, especially with teenagers, they're promised a job. They're promised some sort of um, romantic interest. They're, they're promised a, a completely new life or uh, escape or shelter. They don't realize what they're walking into. Coercion is m even more powerful 
When we talk about coercion, we're talking about the psychological abuses. If you don't do this, you don't really love me. I'm desperate for my mom to love me and I was willing to do whatever it took. If you don't do this, I'm gonna kill your little brother. If you don't do this, I know where your dad lives. I'm gonna kill your dad. Um, if you don't do this, I'm gonna kill you. I mean, we've heard stories of traffickers where the traffickers literally put the gun to their head and pulled the trigger. And there's one bullet in that chamber and it's just waiting for it to come around. Anything that that trafficker can think of to make that victim comply and obey the trafficker, that's what he or she will do. Professional bus drivers, whether passenger or school, dispatch workers, terminal employees, maintenance operators, those folks are on the front lines. Growing up, going to elementary and high school, I rode a school bus. I went to a local Catholic school and I actually had the same driver for the entire duration of my school career. His name was Mr. B. He was an old Southern gentleman who greeted you with your name and looked you in the eye every morning and every afternoon. Being on the school bus was safe because I knew Mr. B wouldn't do anything to me. Getting off the school bus meant that I was unsafe again. But I know that he had some troubling concerns about the fact that there was men waiting outside my house for me. And I think he had a lot of questions, ones that puzzled him that he didn't really have the answer for and probably made him feel sick inside. Jeffco is made up of 86,500 students and we transport pretty much a third of those students. So it can fluctuate one year to the other. Um, last year we were right around 32,000 students that we transport every day. With a topic like this, this is about student safety. This is about, you know, students, you know, who you pick up and you drop off at wherever their location is every day, their safety. And, that, and it goes beyond the bus now. It goes to the point of they're walking away and you're watching which, which cars they're going to and making that difference. So for me, it's taking that extra second. Do we have to add more time to our routes? So be it. If it's gonna save a student from being in a, in a, in a, in a situation that's unfavorable for them. Keep your eyes open if this is just in the back of your mind saying, where is this kid going and is this kid safe? Just take it upon yourself to be a hero in your head for one second. Just to look out for this kid for one second. Half of America's school children ride the bus daily. I mean, you as a school bus driver interact with these kids on a continual basis. What if a child begins to have frequent absences and before they were always on the school bus and go into school? What about if that child appears malnourished or unkempt and disheveled and before, you know, this kid came, clean clothes, you know, hair is brushed, those kinds of things. Or you start to notice major changes in their behavior, uncontrollable anger, or maybe it's uncontrollable crying. There's all sorts of emotional highs and lows, and you're knowing something's just not right with this kid. Do you actually see any outward signs of bruising? Or maybe the kid is showing up with all of the latest gadgets, right? Or their nails done or the hair done. I mean, sometimes the pimps will groom their victims and in doing so, they shower them with affection and attention and purchased items in order to earn that person's trust and affection. It could be as simple as taking note of how they come on the bus and then getting off the bus, and then what's off. If it was 100 degrees out, you would notice someone who came in with a turtleneck and long pants. And you would wonder, what are they hiding underneath the turtleneck? What is the reason for their clothing? Mr. B, um, his position was very strategic because he had eyes and ears on a situation where he could observe my behavior. He could see whether I was happy or sad. Maybe Mr. B really did see the time that my purse knocked over and a bunch of condoms came out. Pair that together with the other indicators of me avoiding his eye contact. Mr. B had the opportunity to observe the comings and goings from my house. Who was there to put me on the bus in the morning and who was there to pick me up at night? Were they always the same people? 
Mr. B kn knew most people's names that would pick up a child. If you are in a position to actually have a conversation, ask them, do they know who's picking them up? You know, are they familiar with the person who put them on the bus? Two girls were um, just sort of skating past an, uh, an abandoned alley, and one of them was dressed in a very revealing outfit, and they looked extremely young. I approached the first one, who was a little bit more brassy with me, gave me a lot of attitude, used a lot of foul language, explained that uh, her father was waiting in a car uh, just across the street, you know. And I looked, I didn't see anything. I asked her to describe the car. She fumbled a little bit. The story just didn't make any sense. I asked them if they were related. One said yes, the other said no. It turns out that the, uh, that the first girl had been missing for the past two years, that she had an open warrant for prostitution from when she was 10 years old. The other girl had been from an affluent neighborhood in a suburban area of New Jersey. Her parents had no idea she'd even left the house. What happened was that uh, the supposed father that was going to pick them up uh, was actually um, a pimp that had instructed the 12-year-old that was working for him to go online and make friends with girls and tried to lure them into the city, which she had done with this 13-year-old uh, girl, it turned out. You can't always find a bad guy, but you can always, always find a victim. They're out there, you know, whether they're about to become a victim or they've been victimized for some time. One of the biggest assets that a school bus driver would have is the rapport that they can build with another human being who trusts them to get them from point A to point B and to keep them safe while they do it. Building that rapport means treating them like a human being and noticing the normal details and the not so normal. School is often one of the last places that these victims are seen before they disappear entirely. They may have already run away from home, but they're still showing up to school. You do not want to talk to this kid and say, are you a victim of human trafficking? <laughs> they will look at you sideways. They have probably never even heard of the term. But if you say something like, is anybody making you do something you're uncomfortable with? Are you being threatened in any way? Is your family being threatened? And when you're talking to that kid, get to know him a little bit. I know the bus ride is not that long, but maybe they can sit behind you. Maybe you can engage them in conversation. Maybe they just know there's a friendly face out there, an adult in their life who actually cares. Ask them, you sure you're all right? Anybody making you do anything you're uncomfortable with? I just want you to know I'm here for you. That makes such a difference when they're actually treated as a human being. If I could tell a bus driver one thing, even my Mr. B, I would tell him that his interaction with me mattered. I would tell him, thank you for just seeing me as a person because for so long I felt like an object. Mr. B should have had a protocol. Mr. B should have known if I see something and I think something's off about this child, I can be anonymous and just report it to the local law enforcement or the trafficking agency. If that step is too scary and overwhelming, I would hope that Mr. B had a manager or someone higher up in his food chain who could make those decisions for him. Having a policy of this is what we will do with suspected trafficking takes the guesswork out because Mr. B would have already known if I see something, I have to say something. Feel free to be wrong that exploitation is happening and being willing just to speak up. Being wrong is great. I actually hope that none of the situations are trafficking. But even if it's not and it's still something bad, you did something good about it. A conversation or an interaction with one of these juveniles who may or may not be missing could yield to us the bad guy's name, where the bad guy lives, what the bad guy's car looks like, sometimes even their license plate, uh, how many other girls or boys are working for this bad guy, uh, what his hours of operation are, the other criminal activities that he's involved in, his known associates, their points of contact, 
and any other crimes that they may have that they may have observed uh, personally for people in the transportation industry. They're key with this because their eyes are out there. You know, most people, when they hear this about this issue, and I get it, it's dark, it's tough. Most people want to help, but not everybody is in a critical position to make an impact, but you guys are. I truly believe that knowledge is what's going to make the difference. If you see something, you can say something. It's going to be that one small act that changes everything for a survivor. If the only thing you do is become trained and knowledgeable and understand that human trafficking even happens, so many people actually think it's a myth. I'm here to tell you that I lived it, I survived it, and no other human being should have to go through it. And so I hope that by watching this today, that you would say enough is enough and I'm tired of human beings being sold.